This is episode 20 of Magic and the Law of Attraction with the splendid soothsayer, Madame Pamita. Hello, everyone. I'm your host, Madame Pamita, and you're listening once again to Magic and the Law of Attraction the podcast where you'll learn how to transform your life in magical ways to make it the very best that it can be. Hello, everyone. I am your host, Madam Pamita, and you're listening to Magic and the Law of Attraction, the podcast where you'll learn how to transform your life in magical ways to make it the very best that it can be. Well, thank you so much for joining me for this podcast episode. This one is a really exciting one. We're going to talk about setting up altars. Oh my gosh, so much fun. Well, one of the things that we like to use on an altar is a candle. We're going to talk about that. But I wanted to let you guys know we have been working here very hard at the Parlor of Wonders, making some brand spanking new candle designs for you. I want you to check out, go to parlorofwonders.com, go to shop and go to candles and go to figural candles and you are going to see some amazing new candles that we've put up. We've got some new molds that we've made that are available nowhere else. We're the only ones. We've got them and we're making them in beautiful beeswax and we are so proud of these candles and so proud of the stories that we get from our clients that use these candles and really make magical change in their lives. So I want you to go check them out. There's some beautiful new ones. We've got a house. We've got a embracing couple. We've got these gorgeous new candles and you can see and learn how to work with these candles by going over to my YouTube page, youtube.com slash Madame Pamita. There's all kinds of spell information, guides, how to videos and all kinds of good stuff over there. So you'll definitely want to check that out. And if you have questions about things like magic, you know, how do I do something? How do I work with a candle? How do I do this? You might want to come on over to our Sunday evening Q&A, our magical Q&A tea party, which is held every Sunday at 5 p.m. on Instagram and on YouTube. Simultaneously, we take we, meaning me, I take your questions and answer those questions about magic, law of attraction, hoodoo, root work, spirit guides soulmates, uh, all that kind of stuff. So any kind of educational question that you have, not personal questions, but educational questions that you have, you can bring them on over there on Sundays at 5 p.m. Pacific to YouTube or to uh, Instagram and you and I will answer them. So moving right along to our topic for this episode of Magic and the Law of Attraction. This week's, this episode's question was sent in by Michelle from Sefner and she asked, how can I set up an ancestor altar? Yes. So how can I set up an ancestor altar? Well, we're going to talk about ancestor altars, but we're going to talk in a broader sense about all spirit guide altars. So a spirit guide, your ancestors can be your spirit guides, and that is definitely one category of spirit guides, but there are many, many, many types of spirit guides. And if you look over or listen, go over to uh, Magic and the Law of Attraction and go back to episodes nine and 10, those are about contacting your spirit guides, who your spirit guides can be, and so on. So we're going to delve a little bit more deeply into creating a spirit guide altar. I talk a little bit about that on that um, podcast, but we're going to go into it in much more depth in this episode. So we are going to talk about in this episode, why would you make a spirit guide altar? The basics for setting up an altar of any kind, including a spirit guide altar, where you can put your altar and a ritual for connecting to your guides once you are at that altar space that you've created. So you're going to have everything you need to know about making an altar and how to use it in your contact with your ancestors or your other spirit guides. So the first thing we're going to answer, I guess, the first part of this is, who are your spirit guides? Well, your spirit guides can be your ancestors for sure. The people who loved you and cared about you in life will care about you in spirit form. But we also have other guides. Angels can be our guides, souls who were once alive but that we didn't know in lifetime. So those could be famous people from the past or regular people from the past. We can have elementals. Elementals are beings that are related to an element such as fire or water or air or spirit. We can have deities show up. So deities could be things like gods or goddesses, saints, holy people, and so on. We could have saints and holy people really don't qualify as deities, but I kind of put them under that umbrella. 
We could also have mythological beings. So mythological beings could be things like creatures, like unicorns, uh, fairies, and so on. Those things that don't really fit. They're sort of elemental. They could be classified as elemental, but I classify them as mythological beings. And if you want to know more about your guides and who your guides are, you'll want to check out those podcast episodes, episodes 9 and 10. That will tell you about connecting with your guides, including how you can listen to a guided meditation to connect with one of your guides. So why would you want to make an altar for connecting to your guides? Well, it's not really a necessary thing. It's something that we had in that we would want, um, you know, to help build that relationship with that guide. So for example, your guides are a council of guides. You have a council of guides around you who are there and who want to help, but they will not interfere or do anything unless they're asked for help. So when you ask for their help, then they can come in and they can do the job. So you might say, for example, I want, you know, my grandfather was really good with money. So I want my grandfather's spirit to come and help me get a better job or buy a house or so on. Or you may not know who your guide is that is the one that's going to help with your money situation or whatever situation. And so you could generally put it out there without even knowing specifically who the guide is. You can just say, of my council of guides, the guide that is going to be most helpful for me to access this job, please come forward and help me get this job. So the guides want to help and want a relationship with us. So building an altar is a place that we can work on that relationship or build that relationship. In a way, it's kind of like asking your guide to stay in your home. You're inviting them in as a guest into your home. You're creating that altar in your home or your office space. It's like you're inviting them over. And it deepens your connection with your guides by giving you a place that you can connect and hang out with them. So it's also a place that we could look at as, you know, any altar is a place that we can do magical work. So if you have a an altar that you're dedicating to a guide for a certain situation, you could also use that altar as a place to do magical work or a place to put a petition about that situation. And it's also another reason we might want to build an altar is we might want to thank our guides for help. So maybe you've received help from your guides and now you kind of want to offer them some kind of offering as uh, in gratitude for their help in the past and to continue that relationship. Then you can create an altar for that. So here's what we need for the basics for uh, a spirit guide altar. The first thing we need is an image of some kind. So the image could be a photo. In case of ancestors who are alive in the time of, you know, photography, we could use a photo of them on that altar. You put it in a frame and put it on that altar. But if you're working with something that is not, um, you know, something that was around during photograph times, then you could work with uh, an illustration or some kind of representation of them, or even a statue. So sometimes when we work with deities, for example, or for with saints, um, we might want to work with a statue of that saint or a statue of that deity to represent that being that we're making our connection with and that we're dedicating the altar to. So either a photo, an illustration, or uh, a statue is a good place to have that image. That sort of sets the tone of who this altar is dedicated to. We also like to put a candle on an altar, and a candle is almost like the the kind of bare basic. Like if we have a even just a photo and a candle, we've set up an altar. So the candles are good because candles um, create uh, an energy that connects to higher realms. You know, we always see like prayers being sent on incense or candles. It's a light energy. It's positive. It's connecting. It's passionate. It's got some life to it. So we like to have a candle on the altar. When you choose your candle that you're going to put on your altar, you may want to consider the color of the candle that you're putting up. So you could use a white candle as an all-purpose blank, you know, candle. So if you don't know what color to pick or you're not being guided in some way of what color to pick, then you could choose a white candle and you'd be fine. You could also choose a color that's special to your saint or your angel or your deity or your ancestor. So sometimes you can look up online and see, for example, um, let's say St. Martha and St. Martha likes red, or you were working with another saint and, you know, Archangel Gabriel and Archangel Gabriel likes white. So you can find that information online and see what color is associated with your deity or your saint. 
if you have an ancestor that you're working with, they may have had a favorite color. So like if you know your mom's favorite color was purple, for example, that you might want to put a purple candle because that's her favorite color. Or, you know, if you have a sense of what that is, it may not be something that you knew in lifetime, but maybe they tell you in um, their connection to you now what their favorite color, what color they would like on the altar, depending on how intuitive you are. You could also choose a color going along with the petition. So let's say, for example, you're working with grandpa about some money issue. You could put a green candle or a gold candle up there for money, and that would be another way to choose the candle color. And if you want to know about those colors and color magic, then you'll want to check out episode two of this podcast because I talk about color magic there and what the colors are associated with. So you can check that out. Now, once you've got your candle, the reason we use a candle, another reason that we have a candle is because it's a ritual to connect to your guide on a daily basis. You're going to light that candle every day and let it burn while you're awake and while you're at home. And when you go out for the day or you go to sleep at night, you're going to snuff the candle out. And each time you connect with that candle to light it again, you can connect with your spirit guide. So you can say, you know, hi, grandpa, you know, I'm just checking in with you. Thank you. I love you or whatever. Or you can tell your deity, your elemental, your angel, whoever, what it is that you are wanting, you know, your petition, repeat that petition when you relight the candle or just say hello. One of the kinds of, there's different kinds of candles that you can use on your altar. One of them is um, the seven day vigil candles or seven, they're sometimes called novena candles. Those ones that come in the tall glass jars, those are very typical for working with on an ancestor altar. That's they're long lasting. You know, you're burning something to keep the energy going. So you want a bigger candle. You don't want a little tiny candle. Um, you want a big candle that you can burn over time. This isn't exactly a spell working. If you're doing a spell, you want that candle to burn completely. But if we're doing a candle for connecting to our guide, we just want to keep that quote unquote eternal flame burning. You can dress those candles. Another reason we want to use a candle is that you can dress those candles with um, oils and use special oils and herbs that are special to that guide. So for example, you could use, for any guide, you could use spirit guide oil. If your guide is a saint or uh, a deity or an angel, you can use all saints oil. If you're working with a Native American or First Nations um, guide, you can use Indian spirit guide oil. You could use a saint oil like St. Dymphna oil or St. Christopher oil if you're working with those particular saints or a folk saint like Santa Muerte or something like that. You can use a specific oil dedicated to them. If you're working with an ancestor, you could just use regular spirit guide oil. Now, additional items that you could have on your altar would be things like a cloth. So you could choose a cloth. Again, choose a color that's a favorite color of your um, your spirit guide, or you could use a cloth that represents what it is that you're trying to manifest and work on with your spirit guide. You could also use curios or souvenirs or objects that are related to your guide or previously owned by your ancestor. So maybe you have your grandfather's watch and you could put that on the altar to connect that altar to him and strengthen that connection to him. Or if you're working with a saint and, you know, um, for example, you're working with St. Lucy, who's a patron saint of eyes, and you're working with St. Lucy on, you know, making your eye operation go well, you could put a pair of glasses on the altar, represent the eyes, so on. So you can find objects or souvenirs or things, curios that connect to the energy of what the work that you're doing or the guide. You could also put things on the altar that you want them to bless. For example, you could, you know, be working to bless your family and you might be calling on an ancestor to protect your family. So you could also put a photo of your family alongside the photo of grandma, grandpa, or whoever that you're working with as an ancestor or the deity that, you know, you're working with either way. Um, You could also put like a lucky charm on there and ask them to bless it and then carry it with you when you leave the house and so on. Now, we also like to make offerings to our spirit guides and Offerings are things that, if we're working with an ancestor, are things that they liked in life. If we're working with a spirit that we didn't know in life, they would be things attributed to that spirit guide. General offerings that we can give to anyone, a, you know, an elemental, an angel, a spirit, a deity, or an ancestor. We can, you know, traditional sort of things would be working with tobacco. So tobacco could be loose tobacco, or it could be a cigar or something like that. You could also offer fruit but make sure the fruit stays fresh. You don't want to get the fruit, let it get moldy or yucky. You, you know, kind of replace that fruit as time goes on. You could also put candy on the altar. You could also offer alcohol on that altar. 
you know, sometimes people put a shot of some kind of alcohol as an offering to that spirit guide. Now you might want to do a particular offering for your guide. So for that, you'd want to do your research. So if you, you know, you didn't know grandpa, but you know, you want to work with grandpa, you might ask a parent or somebody that knew grandpa in life, what did he like? Oh, he liked chocolate. Okay. Well then I'm going to put some chocolate up on the altar right? Or he liked to smoke a pipe, so I'm going to put pipe tobacco on the altar. So that sort of connects to him. When we do, you know, we can also do research on other spirit guides, like saints, for example. You know, when you do work with somebody like, let's say, Saint Expediti, you can learn what are good offerings for him. So when Saint Expediti grants your petition, you ask him for help with a certain objective. And when he helps you, you can leave pound cake. That's very traditional for working with Saint Expediti, leaving pound cake on the altar as an offering. Or with Saint Barbara, for example, you would leave a pomegranate or um, Shiva, you could leave saffron on the altar or Isis, you could leave milk on the altar and so on. So you want to do your research if you're working with um, more well-known deities or saints or angels, what kind of offering they like to have. And you can just sort of research that and put that up on the altar. Now, what we we're talking about in terms of like St. Expediti, you can offer that those things you know, just as a kind of a thank you or a kind of hospitality thing, inviting them into your home and inviting that connection. But you can also use those offerings in exchange for a petition being granted. So like in the same of case, the case of St. Expediti, you could offer that um, pound cake in when your petition is granted. But you could also do things that don't have a, a particular um, physical manifestation. Like for example, you could um, make an offering in exchange for the petition that is like, let's say your grandma was into cats. She had a bunch of cats. She loved cats. So you could say, grandma, when you help me with this situation, I'll donate $100 to a cat shelter if you grant my petition, if you help me with this situation. So whether it's an ancestor or a saint or a deity or an angel, you can kind of, you know, with your research, discover what it is that they're connected to and make an offering that is in their interest, not something that normally maybe you wouldn't do, but they would like you to do as a thank you for them granting your petition. Another thing that we can put on the altar are flowers, plants, flower petals, herbs, all of those things. If you have flowers, um, you want to put them in spring water. You can put them in a little glass or a little vase and put spring water in there. Spring water doesn't have to be gathered from a spring. It could be, but you could also get that from a bottle. You know, there's lots of um, spring water that you can get in a bottle and just use some of that spring water in that um, flower. Both the water and the flower can attract those spirits into a close relationship or into your uh, more interaction, more communication with you. If you put a plant, you can water it with spring water. You could put sprinkle flower petals around, of course, or use herbs on your candle or sprinkle herbs around or hold herbs in a dish. You might also want to use incense. Incense is a really, really traditional way of connecting with spirits and spirit guides because it has that quality. When you see that smoke, it's like going up into the heavens, going out into the world. It has that ethereal quality that spirits have. So traditional sorts of incense that you would use, like really traditional. I mean, you can use cone incense or stick incense, but the real traditional incenses are ones that we burn on a little charcoal. And if you don't know how to do that, you can look at the video I have up on YouTube about working and lighting um, resin incense on charcoal, resin and herbal incense. So the incense that we would use traditionally would be things like copal, um, frankincense, myrrh, palo santo. Palo santo is a wood that has resin in it, but the other three, myrrh, frankincense, and copal are all resin. And so any one of these you'd have to burn on a charcoal because they aren't self-lighting. They don't have anything that's um, combustible. They have to be burned on a charcoal. But that's another beautiful way to sort of invite that energy, invite, you know, it's very enticing to spirits when you burn incense. Another thing we could have on the altar would be a petition paper. Um, if you, petition paper is a way for you to ask for your wish, what it is that you want them to help you with. If you don't know how to do a petition paper, then you want to check out the video I have up on um, Who Do How To or up on my website or up on YouTube, youtube.com slash Madam Pamita. There's a video about petition papers and you can learn how to write out a petition. But basically a petition is you writing out your wish, right? Just writing out what it is that you want them to help you with. Last thing we could put on an altar would be gems. So again, um, gemstones are good for attracting um, spirits. And it's also good for sort of grounding that energy of working with spirits. Spirit work can be very ethereal. And if you have a tendency to get kind of spacey and you need some grounding, then gems are really good for grounding energy in an environment. You can choose gems based on the color. 
color, you know, just like we talked about before, colors that are pleasing to your spirit or colors that are connected to the petition that you have. Um, you could also use gems based on the on the properties of that gem. So for example, uh, you could have like a tiger's eye if you need to be more courageous and more bold and more powerful, you could use tiger's eye. Or if you needed to do well on a test, um, you could use sodalite. You know, there's all kinds of um, gems. And if you take a look at, um, on my website, you take a look at gemstones, um, gems and crystals. You can take a look at the gems that I sell and you'll see what they're used for, what their properties are and how we use them and so on. So that's a really good guide for what gems you could put on your altar. So now once we have all the things that we're going to gather, all those things that we're going to put on our altar, any, you know, all these other things are kind of optional things, but, you know, you definitely want a photo or some kind of image and a candle. Um, and then any number of these other things you can add there. Once you've gathered all that together, you want to decide if you're going to make your altar secret or if you're going to make it out in the open. Now, if you have to make it secret, you can make an altar very, very secret, as particularly the ancestor altar. It's not weird to have a picture of your beloved um, grandfather up and, you know, he was somebody that you in, liked in life and now you're just putting a little candle next to him. I don't think anyone would look at that and think, oh, that's an altar or an ancestor altar, but that can be your ancestor altar and very secretive. But you can also make um, an altar and just have it be very decorative and very much look like an altar and that the magic is going on there. So it just sort of depends on your life circumstances, your life situation, if you can be more out with it or you have to be more secretive, but it's very easy to make an altar that doesn't look like an altar. You also have to decide where you're going to put your altar in terms of where in your house. So if you are inviting in an ancestor or a person who lived in life, then I recommend putting that altar in some place that you would invite them into your home. Meaning, if you were inviting grandpa in your home, you probably wouldn't invite him into your bedroom, but you would invite him into the kitchen or the living room, for example. So putting an altar out there is much better than putting one in your bedroom because it's not kind of appropriate. You know, but if you're inviting, let's say uh, you're working with Aphrodite, who's the goddess of love, and you want to increase your passion or invite a lover into your life, then putting an altar in your bedroom is absolutely appropriate. So you want to choose the location based on the spirit that you're working with and where you would invite them in and what the work you're working on is. Now, if you are working, let's see, so what are the possibilities for working where you could put your altar? Well, you could put a small dedicated table, like an end table or a tray, and make a, an official altar. You could even make a big table, make a huge altar. I've seen beautiful altars up on Instagram. You see, I see people's altars all the time that are just gorgeous and big and beautiful, and they absolutely look on, like altars. But you could take a large table or a small table, end tables like the perfect size, or a tray, and put that um, altar up and have enough space to put your um, your cloth and your uh, candle and your picture and some tobacco and some incense and so on. If you need to be a little more secretive, you could put your altar on a shelf, on a bookshelf. Um, just clear off one of your bookshelves and put your little curios and things there and nobody's going to be any the wiser, right? They're just going to think, oh, it's a little decoration, right? You could also put it on a, a window ledge or something like that. You could put a little altar there by putting a photo and a candle and so on there, and it's less noticeable. You could make portable altars. If you really have to be more secretive about your work, then you could put an altar in a cigar box, for example, make a tiny altar with a picture of your loved one and your offerings and your candle and just set it up when you do the work with the spirit and then close it up and put it away. Same thing with a shoe box. You could use a shoe box for uh, making an altar that's portable and that you put away when you're done. You don't have to be limited to the house, you know, when it comes to making an altar. You can make an altar out in your garden if you, you know, are working with a deity that's more nature oriented. A garden is a perfect place. Or if you want to take your altar with you, you could use your car dashboard or the um, sort of the nooks of your car where, you know, you kind of put things. You can make a little altar in your car. You could also put a corner of your desk at your office if you're working on that kind of energy and working with work or, or career success or something like that, you could put a little altar on the corner of your desk. So there's really no limit to how public you want to make it, how altery you want to make it look. There's definitely places that you can do that. Then you want to start by making and creating a ritual. Once you've created that altar, you put it all together, you want a ritual for connecting with your ancestors or guides. So for that, you would do this. First, you want to start by quieting your mind and sitting in front of your altar space. 
if you are driving, you don't want to drive and do this, you know, your your altar's in your car, you want to pull over if you're going to do this, but any place else, you could just sit quietly, close your eyes, quiet your mind, and just sit in front of your altar space. If you like, you can, you know, if it's helpful for you, you can play some peaceful music, some quiet music, some music that maybe was a favorite of your ancestor, or something that connects you to the spirit that you're working with. The next thing I would recommend is lighting your incense. If you um, can't tolerate incense, you can make a smokeless incense by putting an oil into a spray bottle, adding some spring water, shaking it up and spraying it around. Or you can light an incense in the traditional way using frankincense, Miracle Paul, Palo Santo, or, um, you know, fragrance of your choice to connect to your guides in that way. And that sort of invites them. It's very, very um, yummy. You know how when you walk by a store that has incense burning and you go, oh, I want to go in that store. It smells so good. It's the same thing for your guides. It draws them closer. Once you've lit your incense, you've kind of set the mood, set the tone. You can light your candle and you can light that candle with your intention to talk to your guide. So speak out loud or in your mind's ear, I guess mind's mouth, (laughs) you could speak out loud or in your mind um, with your guide. You may experience meeting your guide visually. That would be meeting in your mind's eye. So you might see your guide come forward if you have your eyes closed and are looking at a visualization, doing a visualization in your mind's eye. You might hear their voice in your mind's ear or get that positive sensation in your mind's body, something like warmth or tingling, or you could feel an emotion in your mind's heart, which is a feeling of peace or happiness or love. You may get that sensation and then dismiss the sensation. This often happens with people who just start doing spiritual work or working with spirits. You'll get a sensation and you'll go, oh my gosh, that's a spirit. It's my ancestor talking to me. And then you'll go, nah, that's just me making it up. Or nah, I'm imagining things. So if that's happening and you're dismissing the sensation that you're having, tell yourself, let's pretend and see what happens. Let's just pretend this is my ancestor talking to me. Let's pretend this is my spirit guide showing me something or telling me something or this experience, this physical experience that I'm having. Let's just pretend it's my guide connecting with me. That let's pretend will free up your critical mind so that you don't um, second guess yourself or doubt or judge or back off from it. Then once you do get that connection, you can start asking questions and see what responses you get from your guide. So the visual, you know, the guide, if the guide works more visually, you could see your guide, for example, giving you something, a symbolic gift, or telling you words, or getting ideas or feelings. And those are all valid answers from your guides. So ask the question in your mind, or speak it out loud, and then see what message you get back. It could be a visual, it could be words, it could be ideas, it could be feelings any one of those. When you've finished having your session talking and spending time with your guide, you want to say thank you to your guide. Thank you for coming in. Important thing to do, and you know, I didn't mention this at the beginning, is that you want to ask your guides to come in with, you know, ask guides at the highest, highest vibration. You would never just ask any old person to come into your house. You would only invite your friends or people that you trusted into your home, right? And so the same thing goes for guides. When you work with your guides, you always want to ask for guides at the highest vibration. And in particular, you can name the guide that you want to come forward. But I always like to preface it with that highest vibration and guides that are going to offer clarity and uh, messages that are helpful. So then when you're finished, you can thank your guide and release them and let them go. Now, you can leave your candle lit when you're at home and you're awake. But when you go to sleep or leave the house, you snuff your candle out, of course, and you relight it when you're home and you get home, back home, or you wake up again. And when you relight it, you can have a little mini conversation with your guide. You can say hello, you can say hi, I love you, or thank you, or something like that. Or you can actually sit down and have that meditation again when you sit down with your guide. You don't have to leave that altar up forever. That's something that people wonder about. Well, how? What if? What happens if I take down my altar? Or what? You know, what happens if I have to move or something like that happens? Your altar is just like asking your guide to come visit your home, but it's like asking a relative to come stay at your home. You don't necessarily have to have them live there forever. You can invite them for a little time with you and then let them go. Let them go back to the spirit world and, you know, come down to you, you know, talk to you whenever you need to. So when you take down your altar, it doesn't mean that you're abandoning your ancestor or your guide. It just means that your visit with them and and this time is over and that um, just like they were visiting you at your home. You can still connect to your guide without having an altar. It doesn't, it's not a necessary thing. It's just there for deepening that connection to you. 
So when you dismantle your altar, you also thank them for that time that they spent with you. Thank you for coming into my home. Thank you for spending time with me. Thank you for all the time that we had together. Some people like to time that altar based on the candle. They'll burn one novena candle, those tall glass encased candles, and that will be the time that they spend with their guide. And once that candle is burned, it's time for another altar or change of altar or something like that. Other people like to change the altars with the seasons, you know, as the time, you know, changes, we're in... Uh, spring or fall equinox or summer solstice or winter solstice is a time for a new altar or to connect with a new guide. Or you may just have gotten everything that you want from them and it's you feel like it's time to move on. There's no rules about it. But don't feel worried or sad or feel like you're um, doing something bad by ending that altar or changing that altar. So I hope that answered your question about making an ancestor altar, or making a spirit guide altar. Um, does it for this episode of Magic and the Law of Attraction. And if you would like to get more info about spirit guides, you will want to check out my podcast, episodes 9 and 10, which are both about connecting to your spirit guides, including your ancestors. And make sure to please subscribe to my monthly magic newsletter. Did I say spell a week newsletter? I don't know if I did. It used to be this spell a week, but you know, it gets busy here. So we call it the monthly magic now. If you have subscribed to my monthly magic newsletter, you'll get a free copy of my ebook, Seven Secrets to Supercharge Your Spell Work. Just go to sevensecretsebook.com and get your free copy today. And I want to say another big, big, big thank you to Michelle for her super amazing, lovely, awesome question about ancestor altars. If you have a question about spells, hoodoo, law of attraction, divination, or any other magical or spiritual topic, go to magicandthelawofattraction.com. Scroll down to the bottom and submit your questions there. I love getting your questions, guys. That's what makes this show is your questions. You co-create this show with me. I love it. Um, If we pick your question for a future episode, you will get a $50 gift certificate to Madame Pamita's Parlor of Wonders, which is my online esoteric emporium, spiritual apothecary, and repository of arcane wisdom. It's your one-stop online shop for magical supplies, tarot reading spells, classes, and a ton of free magical instruction. Everything we've talked about, including gemstones, herbs, candles, all those things we talked about putting on your altar are all available at parlorofwonders.com. So get on over there and check it out and get your stuff for your ancestor altar right now. I want to say a huge thank you to all the fabulous Law of Attractioneers out there who have subscribed to this podcast and shared it with your friends. If you subscribe to it on iTunes, you can leave a review on iTunes. And then every episode, we do a little we meaning me. I don't know why I say we, me, my, me and my guides. <laughs> We pick out our favorite written review from the latest reviews and give that person a free 30-minute reading, which could be a tarot reading, a spirit guide reading, or a past life reading, a 30-minute session. It could even be a lesson if you want some spiritual coaching. So our pick for this episode is Hopeful Magician. And Hopeful Magician said, a true gift for teaching. So sweet. That's really sweet of you to say. This podcast really reached out to me at the right time. I really wanted to bring magic back into my life for a long time. And I've been peeking about many corners for the last year, hoping to find a guide, guide, there's a keyword, that would be filled with positive energy and the ability to break down bigger concepts into smaller bite-sized pieces. I see that the podcast stopped this summer. Oh no, but they're back now. Yay. I very much hope that Madame Pemita will continue to add new lessons soon as I've been binge listening all week. Until then, I'll start checking out her YouTube channel. Thanks for the magic. Oh, thank you, Hopeful Magician. That is really a sweet, sweet review. If you'd like to get a gift certificate for a 30-minute reading, you should leave an iTunes review too. And um, Hopeful Magician, please email me at info at parlorofwonders.com so we can send you your certificate for your free 30-minute reading. So I hope I see you guys on iTunes. I hope I see you here again next time. And I hope I see you Sundays at my magical Q&A on Instagram and YouTube. And yeah, keep coming back. We got lots and lots more to share. Keep asking those great questions. As long as the questions keep coming, I'll keep answering them. Thank you so much for joining me. I look forward to our next episode when we'll be answering the question, 
How do I let go and manifest like a master? Ooh, that'll be a good one. Until next time, this is Madame Pamita saying, keep making your life the most magical adventure ever. One, two,